Okay, welcome to Chapter 3 on Financial Statements and Ratio Analysis. This is going to be a review from what you learned in MBA 533, but we're going to go a little bit deeper. One of the fundamental skills you have to walk out of an MBA with is the ability to read financial statements and analyze the financial health of a company. So we're going to hit this hard, and by the time you're done with between this and your team project, you're going to feel pretty comfortable being able to judge how a company is doing. All right, let's talk about financial statements in review. Remember from accounting, the income statement summarizes the company's results for a period. So this is usually called our profit and loss statement. Um, generally, they're prepared quarterly, but we are usually keeping track of them much more frequently than that um, for both tax purposes and for our internal decision making. So our income statement shows us the um, revenues and the expenses, basically, uh, what the company does during the period. The balance sheet is a snapshot of the firm's assets and liabilities and their equity at any given point in time. Remember the basic balance sheet equation you learned in MBA 533, which is assets equals liabilities plus equity. So assets are the things that we own. Liabilities are the debt. Equity is the ownership in the company. So our assets are what we have have to equal how we got them. So we got them either by borrowing money or for, by putting in the money ourselves as the owners. So think about your balance sheet very simply as being your house. You know that your house is worth $100,000. You have a $40,000 mortgage on it. The equity in your home, therefore, has to be $60,000. Same thing with a company. Here's a typical balance sheet, what it looks like. Um, this is the liabilities and stockholders equity section. Um, what I wanted to point out here, because again, you did learn most of this in financial accounting, so I don't want to repeat it too much. But what I did want to point out to you, now we're going a little bit more in detail in the equity section. So you'll see some information. This particular company has long-term debt, has preferred stock, common stock, and has retained earnings, for, which are the cumulative earnings you know, that the company hasn't paid out in dividends. So we're going to get, um, as we go through the chapters here, we're going to get deeper into what these different types of stock mean, but I just wanted to point that out right now. All right, the other um, financial statement that you learned about was the statement of retained earnings. So retained earnings, remember, if a company makes money, so they have net income, they have two choices. They either pay it out to the owners as dividends, or they keep it. The reason they keep it is to reinvest it in the company and to ultimately make more money for the owners. So our retained earnings just show what that decision has been. So how much have they accumulated every year and what's happened between with that, uh, the profit that they made, what did they do with it? All right, the last statement we're going to talk about, which in the world of finance is the most important, is the statement of cash flows. This shows you what a company is doing on a cash basis. So where is the dollars coming in and going out for the firm? So we split the cash flow statement into three sections, operating, investing, and financing. And we look at what happened, what brought cash into our business, and where did cash go out. So it's really important because we can't spend profits. We can only spend cash. Lots of companies may look good on paper, but when it comes down to cash flow, they don't have it. Cash flow is very important also for timing. So think about yourself and your personal life. You may know you make $50,000 a year in salary, and you have $45,000 a year in expenses, so therefore you're fine. That's great, but what that doesn't tell you is, do I have $5,000 in the bank when the school tax bill is due? Cash flow is going to show you the timing of that money, when it comes in and when it goes out. And cash flows also really have less ability to be manipulated by a company. So cash flows are really a good way to judge the financial health of a company. And we'll give you some tips on that as we go through. All right, so let's look at what we do when we do ratio analysis. So first of all, who, who would be doing this kind of thing? Who's looking at a company uh, and trying to analyze their health? So we talk about ratio analysis, remember we're just talking about a way of comparing numbers. So you use ratios in your personal life all the time. You talk about somebody's batting average or the miles per gallon on your vehicle. All those are ratios. Ratios just allow us to compare things of different sizes or at different time periods. So who cares about these? Well, first of all, our shareholders. If I own shares in a company, I want to know how they're doing. If I'm thinking about investing in a company, I want to know how they're doing. Um, other people who are very interested, creditors and potential creditors. You want to come to me for a loan, I want to make sure you're going to be around for a long time to pay me back. I also want to know if you're using the money wisely, if this is a good risk for me to take. And then obviously management, internal management wants to know how a company is doing, look at ratio analysis to try to make the company better, to compare themselves to their peers, to understand whether their bonus is going to get paid that year. Lots of reasons why internally you want to look at 
your ratios. So we're going to do two comparisons uh, every time we do a ratio analysis. We're going to do what's called a cross-sectional anal analysis. So we take a company okay, at a certain point in time and we're going to compare it to other companies. So who would be like us that would be a good comparison for us? So when we do a um, cross-sectional analysis, we're really saying, um, if I know I made 12% return, how do I know if that's good or not? And the answer is, well, what do other companies like me do? And that gives me a good indication of whether my return is acceptable for the industry and the economic conditions that I'm living in. So cross-sectional analysis is really important. We talk about benchmarking, which is saying which of these companies do we feel would be the best comparison to make and who we would most like to be like. Okay, so maybe if we're a um, you know, up-and-coming realtor or uh, realtor, up-and-coming uh, retail company. Maybe we want to be like Walmart, so we're going to compare ourselves to Walmart's numbers and try to get to those. Um, maybe not. <laughs> maybe we'd want to compare ourselves to someone else. But when we have uh, ratios, they don't mean anything at all unless we make some comparisons, and we always need to compare them to somebody else like us in our industry. Sometimes it's tough to find somebody like us, but at least um, someone who are um, customers would consider as potential you know companies they'd want to do business with so those people who might be our competitors we also often look at industry averages you had to do this in your 533 project and industry averages are a way of saying okay everybody else who does what I do if you average all of them where do we fall so another good measure gives us a reference point the second type of ratio analysis is time series analysis so this is getting to trends. So yes, we are lower than the industry, but we've been improving for the last five years. Or yeah, we're higher than the industry, but we've been declining for the last five years. Not a good trend. So time series analysis looks at what's happened with our ratios in the past. So it gives us a good indication of what our trend is. Are we going up? Are we going down? Are we making headway? Or are we falling further behind? So ideally, when we do our ratio analysis, we'd like to have something like this that shows here's three years worth of data for our company, and here's three years for the industry. Now I have a ton of information there. I know in this case, the Bartlett company is doing better on average. Or actually, it's, this is the average collection period. So Bartlett is doing worse because the collection period is higher. It's taking them longer to collect their debts. So I've been kind of having a bad trend here, and the industry has been consistently doing better. So that gives me more information than just a single point in time. So when we do the ratio analysis, we have to, um, we have to do our ratios in, we have to take some into account some potential problems with our ratio analysis. So, in other words, they're a very important part of our financial story, but they're not the end-all, be-all. Okay, so we have to always ask why. I tell my students all the time that if we do the very, very best job in ratio analysis that we possibly can, when we're all done, we have more questions than answers. And those questions need answers. So sometimes we can get them because we have access to the company or we can look up the information. And sometimes we can't. So we just have to make a judgment based on how severe are those questions and how much do they make us question the you know, viability of the company. So we're looking at the fact that these deviations from the norm are the possibility of a problem but may not actually indicate a problem. So let's say I say, gee, you know, um, your profit margin has been lower than the industry average for the past three years. Um, it's improving a little bit, but it's still low. Well, then if I tell you that you know, the company's main plant was hit by a hurricane four years ago and they're still managing to make a profit, now you might feel better about it. So a lot of times there's extenuating circumstances. Um, we can never judge too much on a single ratio. We always have to look at a combination of ratios to really judge the company because ratios, like all financial numbers, can get manipulated. Um, we also have to try to look at audited financial statements to make sure the ratios that we're calculating are based on numbers that have been peer-reviewed, you know, looked at by an analyst or some kind of um, outside auditor who has um, kind of blessed them to make sure that there's not funny business going on there. Um, and we also have to watch out for inflation. Yeah, our numbers may be getting better just because cost of living has gone up and we've been raising our prices. All right, let's talk about some of the ratios that we're going to be looking at. And we won't go into too much depth in these because the actual number calculations aren't hard. What's hard is trying to understand the why behind the ratios. So first of all, we're going to talk about liquidity ratios. 
liquidity ratios give us an indication of the company's ability to repay their short-term obligations. So how much trouble could they get into in the short term? How, much, how many um, assets do they have that will allow them to pay off their liabilities? So in this case, for current ratio, the first liquidity ratio we look at, we take current assets and divide them by current liabilities. In this case, for Bartlett, we took a million two divided by 620. We got a current ratio of 1.97. Again, that doesn't tell us much by itself. We need to have those comparisons both to the industry and a time series analysis. So if we look at this liquidity ratio of 1.97, we know that they have more current assets than current liabilities, which is good, but we don't know the exact, um, you know, how this fares versus the other companies in their industry. So most of the time, as a really general rule of thumb, we'd like our um, current ratio to be at least 2 to 1. They're pretty close to that, so it's pretty comfortable. Now, for some industries, it doesn't, they don't hit 2 to 1 because of the nature of their business. Some industries, they need to be actually much higher. So it's just a very general rule of thumb there. Okay, we move on in liquidity to the quick ratio. Quick ratio, again, a measure of our ability to pay our short-term obligations. But now with the quick ratio, instead of looking at all our current assets, we take out inventory. So what we're really asking here is if we need to, if we need to liquidate assets in order to pay off our short-term debt, and we don't want to count on inventory, do we have enough? So here you can see for Bartlett, taking out inventory, our, current, our quick ratio is 1.51. That's pretty good. In general, we'd like our quick ratio to be at least 1. And that tells you that even without inventory, um, they still are relatively comfortable in their ability to pay their short-term obligations should they need to liquidate assets to do that. Now, why do we take out inventory? Well, inventory, if you think about just retail stores that you go into, when companies have to move inventory fast, they typically have to do it at quite a markdown. And inventory is not always as liquid as you might think. It's a current asset, but when push comes to shove and you've got to sell it fast, sometimes you have to do it at a drastic markdown or at actual scrap value. So we don't want to count on inventory if we're a creditor and we want the company to be able to pay us back. Okay, so that was just an uh, introduction to a couple of the basic uh, liquidity ratios. There's quite a few more. Now we're going to move on to activity ratios. The first activity ratio we're going to look at is inventory turnover. Inventory turnover is simply how are we moving our goods, turning product into sales. So we take our cost of goods sold and divide it by our inventory. And for Bartlett Company, we get an answer of 7.2. The way we interpret this answer, we are saying 7.2 times per year Bartlett turns over their inventory. Now think about what seven times a year means. It means every few months their inventory is moving. So it's taking them uh, less than two months for their inventory to come in the door and go out the shelves. Obviously we'd like this number to be bigger. The bigger the better. The faster we turn over our inventory, the quicker we're getting cash in our business. Again, we have to be careful though because there's ways to manipulate this number um, if we judge everybody based on just that sole ratio. Another activity ratio is average collection period. Very simply, how do we collect on our bills? So we take our accounts receivable divided by our average sales per day. So how long are our receivables sitting there you know, waiting to be collected? Our average sales per day is just the sales divided by 365. So in this case, for Bartlett, we get an answer of 59.7 days. So it's taken them almost two months to collect on their debts. Is that good or bad? depends on their industry. So if you're retail, that's pretty bad. If you're medical, that's pretty good because it takes a long time for insurance claims to hit. So again, we want to compare that. Obviously, the lower the number here, the better. If we can collect our money quicker, we can do more with it. Uh, another activity ratio we look at is total asset turnover. For total asset turnover, we take our sales and divide it by our total assets. This tells us how our assets are generating sales dollars for us. In this case, for Bartlett, the answer is 0.85. Um, how is 0.85? Again, depends on how the industry is doing. Their asset turnover is telling you how they convert asset dollars into sales dollars. In this case, uh, 3 million in sales out of 3. almost 6 million in assets. All right, now we're going to move on to the debt ratios. Debt ratios just give us some indication of how the company is utilizing debt or how much debt they're utilizing. So the first one is just the basic debt ratio, just liabilities divided by assets. So of all the assets we have, how much have we financed by liabilities versus equity? So in this case for Bartlett, it's 45.7%. It tells us that 46% of their assets are financed by debt. Therefore, the other percentage, so if we have 46 
financed by debt, then 54% is financed by equity. Those two have to add up to 100 to keep that balance sheet equation balanced. So is 46% debt too high? Well, it depends on the industry. There really is no magic answer there. In general, we'd like to have less debt than more debt. However, debt can be a very good thing. If the company's using borrowed funds to make more money for the owners, it can make more money for the owners than if they didn't use the borrowed funds. So it can be a good thing as well. So that one it's kind of hard to put a judgment on unless we have that industry comparison. Okay, another uh, debt ratio we look at is times interest earned. Times interest earned is our earnings before interest and taxes divided by our taxes. So it's asking us, out of our operating profits, how long, actually that's incorrect, it should be earnings before interest and taxes divided by our interest. That's a mistake on this slide. So earnings before interest and taxes divided by our interest payment is telling us how much we have to pay, um, how many times over we can pay our interest with our earnings. So interest, again, is what we pay to utilize debt. And this is saying, how comfortable are we? Because we have to pay our interest no matter what. Do we have plenty of earnings to pay that interest or not? Okay. So again, remember, I apologize for that mistake on the slide. It's earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest. So hopefully that's right in your textbook, and I will double check that one. Okay, so for Bartlett Company, another option we have when we do an analysis of them is to do a common size analysis. And let me show you what that looks like here. Common size is just a way of taking from some baseline and making the same measurement. So in this case, you'll see Bartlett's income statement for 2012 and 2011. We always use sales for an income statement as our base, so sales is 100%. We take every other number on the income statement and divide it by our sales number. So in this case, we see our cost of goods sold was 68% of sales, our gross profit margin 32%, etc., etc., et cetera, down. And we can then compare over time, even if our company's changed size, you know, it's gotten bigger, gotten smaller, we can compare whether our um, different categories of expenses have kind of gotten out of control or gotten, you know, made some improvements. So in this case, you could say, um, let's look at one here, like our depreciation expense went from 7.3% of sales to 9.3%. Why? What's going on? Um, why did our profit margin, our operating margin, go from 13.6 to 11.8? Um, or, I'm sorry, 11.8 to 13.6. Okay, then we have a profitability ratio. And a profitability ratio, like our gross profit margin, um, gives us just an indication of how much money we're making. How much money we're making. In this case, we take our sales minus our cost of goods sold, and we divide it by our sales. Okay? What does that mean? So if we take our sales and we subtract out what we, you know, what those goods cost us and divide it by our sales, that's our gross profit. That's how much money we're making before we subtract all the other stuff. So our, oper our other operating expenses, our salaries um, for, you know, administrators and all that kind of stuff. So in this case, before we consider all those other expenses, um, Bartlett's making 32%. So it sounds pretty good, but we don't know until we compare it to something. Our net profit margin then is after everything else is subtracted, divided by sales. So 32% is just our cost of goods sold. Net is after everything else is taken out. And you can see here Bartlett drops down to 7.2%. Again, could be good, could be bad, depending on the comparison. Okay, the other profitability ratio we look at is earnings per share. Um, earnings per share is a real popular measurement for a stock of a company. We take the earnings available for the common stockholders. We divide by the number of shares outstanding. So it's a way of measuring, based on our investment in the company, how much is the company making us. So in this case, the company made 221000 They had 76000 um, stockholders, so they got about 290 per share. It doesn't mean every stockholder got a check for 290 because the company may have uh, retained quite a bit of that or all of it, but it just kind of gives us an idea for our investment how much money the company is making. All right, then we have um, return on assets. Return on assets is basically how much um, our assets are generating for us. So we take our earnings available for common, so that's on our income statement, divided by our total assets. Obviously, we would like our assets to generate as much as possible for us. So in this case, our assets are generating a 6.1% return on assets. If we can make more money off of less assets, we're going to have a competitive advantage compared to our other companies in our industry. So that's one of the things that return on uh, assets is measuring for us. Okay, then we look at return on equity. 
So this is looking for the investment that the common stockholders make. How much money are we making for them? So we take our earnings available for common stockholders and divide it by the common stockholders equity. And in this case, you see that our equity holders are making 12.6%. So that's how much we're earning on their behalf. And they can compare that to other earnings, um, you know, other potential investments they have and see if we're doing a good job or not. Okay, another ratio that we like to use, um, actually it's really common, uh, commonly used to make investing decisions, is the uh, price-earnings ratio. Price-earnings ratio takes the market price per share of common stock and divides it by an earnings per share. Okay, when we take market price per share divided by earnings per share, we're taking a market number, market price, that's set by the stock market by buyers and sellers coming together, and we're dividing it by an accounting number, earnings per share. So our answer, like in this case for Bartlett, we have a current stock price of 32.25. Our earnings per share was 2.90. We got an answer of 11. That's telling us that for every dollar in earnings, stockholders are willing to pay $11 for the stock. So it's telling us a measure of how expensive a stock is relatively. So a higher P/E ratio would indicate that people are willing to pay more for the same dollar of earnings. Why would they be willing to pay more? because people buy stock based on the future, what they think is going to happen to a company. So the higher the P.E. ratio, the more um, investors expect that company to do higher, better earnings, do better later. So it's really a measure of the uh, investor confidence in this stock. A high P.E. ratio means people are bullish on this stock, they think it's going to do well. A low P.E. ratio can mean the opposite. They're not too happy about this stock, they don't think it's going to do well. Sometimes, though, a low P.E. ratio can mean people just don't know about this company or it's been unfairly tarnished because of some other issues in the news with companies in its industry or something like that. So the P.E. ratio is one of those that, um, you know, if you pick up the Wall Street Journal or your own local newspaper's business section, you'll see it reported on the ticker line um, for that company. P.E. ratio is one a lot of people make their in investing decisions based on but it's not clear how you should make that decision. So in other words, some people, and we call these guys growth investors, typically pick stocks with high P.E. ratios because they think those stocks are hot stocks that are going to continue to get hotter and they're going to continue to make money for them. However, those stocks are relatively expensive, so it's harder to make money when you buy something relatively expensive. A value investor looks for stocks that have low P.E. ratios, and they're hoping that they found something that the market is undervalued, they buy it cheap, and they're going to be able to then make a whole bunch of money. So both are very popular with a lot of big-name investors, uh, two schools of thought on how to invest. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is the DuPont system of analysis. And it sounds like a fancy thing, but it's really not. What DuPont does is it breaks down the return on assets into its components, okay? So this is just algebra here, but basically by taking the different um, items that go into overall return on assets, we can look at what components help us to get a better return. So in other words, if we see that our total asset turnover and our net profit margin are both components of our return on assets, then we know we have to improve, in order to improve our return on assets, either we have to make more money by keeping our costs in control or raising our price, or we have to utilize our assets more efficiently. So the reason we do the DuPont system analysis is to break down the why or the how. How do we get at making improvements so that we can get a better return on those assets? And this will tell you, well, the secret to making money in business, getting a better return, we either have to be able to charge more in price or command more in sales, be more efficient in our costs by lowering our costs, or we have to be more efficient in how do we utilize our assets. So all of those are keys to how a business does better. So hopefully you've gotten a little bit of an introduction here into ratio analysis, and uh, you'll get plenty of opportunity to practice this in your team assignment as well as this week's homework assignments.